to our virtual stage. Thank you for this invitation to speak about a subject which I've long viewed as being both significant in the history of the province and important to its future. I was quite interested when Craig told me that a discussion of regionalization would be the focus of your convention this year, even though it was going to be a virtual one. In my view, the benefits of employing a system of regionalization would seem to be so obvious that one would have expected such a system to have been put in place in this province a very long time ago. Regionalization was, of course, brought to North America by the European powers that established colonies on this continent. Shires, which later evolved into counties, existed in Britain for centuries before the Norman Conquest in 1066. They started out as divisions of governed territory, created primarily for the administration of justice, collection of taxes, and for defense. Over time, they served other government purposes as well, including local area governmental administrative functions, boundaries for parliamentary seats, and later for planning and administration of rural areas. While a regional structure may have started out as the means by which central government power and control was enforced, during the past couple of centuries, particularly the last century, it has evolved in most areas to become a means of substituting local for central control in matters specifically relevant to the region, a means of inducement and encouragement for residents of regions to become involved and take some responsibility for promoting development and improvement and economic, social, and environmental betterment in their areas. That, in my view, would be the real value of regionalization in this province. It would benefit not only the regions where citizens participate, it would benefit the whole province. It is a pe peculiarity uh, of all of the colonial provinces of, and states that are subdivisions of the North American countries colonized by Britain and European powers, that the only one that did not develop a regional public administrative system was Newfoundland and Labrador. That begs the question, why is Newfoundland and Labrador the only North American colony where to this day such regionalization has not been implemented? Achieving a fuller understanding of that peculiarity and all its aspects is, I believe, essential to successful pursuit of regionalization in this province. That would include considering, at least briefly, the historical reasons for that peculiarity, its effect on life governmental administrations, and the reasons why non-implementation has been so persistent, notwithstanding its use, under one name or another, virtually everywhere else in North America. It will also require some assessment of the extent, if any, to which the lack of regionalization has adversely impacted the quality of life in the province, and that continuing to operate without it will likely continue to adversely impact us. Only then will we be in a position to make a case that the people of this province will be better served by implementing a full or partial regionalization structure as a means of dealing with the myriad of concerns in economic, social, cultural, security, environmental, and other areas that are of great concern to the people in the various parts of the province. Seeking an explanation for the markedly different governmental development in Newfoundland and Labrador from its 16th century colonial beginnings to today will, I suggest, require consideration of the circumstances <laughs> existing in three distinct historical periods. First, from earliest days to responsible government in 1855. Second, from the responsible government in 1855 to confederation in 1949. And a third period, from confederation in 1949 to today. From the earliest days to responsible government in 1855. For its first 150 years of European involvement, after Gilbert claimed Newfoundland for England in 1583, conventional colonization, orderly settlement, and development of governmental administration were all severely limited, strongly discouraged, and at times, actions were taken to prevent them. 
On a couple of occasions, attempts were made to establish proprietary colonies, one at Cupid's in 1610, another at Fairland in 1634, but they did not succeed. They didn't last very long. Over time, in the early years, there came to be two distinct competing non-Aboriginal interests in Newfoundland. One was the adventurers and merchants of West Country, England, who sent ships and men out each spring for the summer fishery along the coast of Newfoundland, with the captains being obligated to bring all crew members and fishermen back each fall. The second group were the few planters and inhabitants who hid out and did not return to England uh, or otherwise managed to get to and stay in Newfoundland. Those adventurers and fishing merchants of West Country England had immense influence in Parliament at the time. That influence was sufficiently pervasive and persistent to cause implementation of a policy that was deliberately designed to prevent efficient and orderly development of Newfoundland and Labrador as a colony. During this period, the official policy of Parliament was to create circumstances in the Newfoundland fishery that would best protect the interest of the West Country merchants and at the same time produce large numbers of experienced seamen available to man the Royal Navy. In those first centuries, the absolute authority in any particular area of Newfoundland as admiral of that area for the fishing season was accepted to be the right of the captain of the first British fishing vessel to arrive in that area in each spring. The second captain to arrive was vice admiral and the third captain was rear admiral. When the vessels returned to England in the fall, there was no authority left in place. The practice was ultimately codified into law by King William's Act in 1699. As well, this policy was furthered by the deliberate withholding of the essentials for governmental order and the administration of justice for those persons who defied the restrictions and settled here anyway and lived over winter. While the views of historians sometimes conflict, a couple of brief excerpts from their writings and from comments of officials at the time will give a better flavor of the circumstances and their impact than anything I might say. A couple of comments by one William Knox, who was Under Secretary of State in the UK, and he gave evidence to Parliament on this matter in 1793. And he said, amongst other things, this. The island of Newfoundland has been considered in all former times as a great ship moored near the Grand Banks during the fishing season for the convenience of English fishermen. He also said, to prevent the increase of inhabitants in the island, the most positive instructions were given to the governors not to make any grants of land and to reduce the number of those who were already settled there. Their vessels, as well as those belonging to the colonies, and I presume that meant Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, and Canada, or what was called Canada then, were to be denied any priority of right in occupying stations in the bays or harbors for curing fish over the vessels from England." Unquote. The Imperial Parliament had enacted a statute in 1775 that dealt with, the, in, in the main, with protecting the fishery from access by other British colonies in North America. Again, this was not really for the benefit of any colonist trying to establish a home in Newfoundland, but for the benefit of the fishery carried on from England. In order to achieve the stated purpose of the statute, which was stated to be this, to ensure return of fishermen to Britain at the end of the season. In order to achieve that, the new statute required that those fishermen be paid only one half of their wages while they were in Newfoundland, with the remaining half to be paid on their return to Britain in the fall. Still, fishermen and their families found their way to ever more remote bays and coves and islands distributed along the extensive coastline of Newfoundland and continued to fish and live where they wanted to. A current historian, Jerry Bannister, recently uh, published a, an excellent book called The Rule of the Admirals, and he's referring to the fishing admirals. In it, he wrote this, quote, in strictly official terms, Newfoundland was not a colony, 
but rather a seasonal station for the migratory fishery operated from England. Governed by the Commodore of the Naval Squadron sent each year to protect the fishing fleet, it was seen as a valuable source for trained sailors. Unlike settled colonies, such as Massachusetts, the island was supposed to remain merely a place for fishing crews to work, where the English merchants could extract as much profit as possible with minimum investment in local infrastructure. Historians have charted the impact of this policy through constitutional guideposts. The island had no court of civil jurisdiction until 1791, no newspaper until 1807, no civil governor until 1825, and no legislative assembly until 1832. And a story of retarded development is a well-worn tale." Unquote. In stark contrast, Newfoundland's uh, Atlantic Province's neighbors, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island, were treated in a markedly different manner. Nova Scotia, with a land area less than half the size of the island part of Newfoundland and Labrador, received elected representative government in 1758. That was 74 years before this province got it in 1832. By 1759, boundaries were established in Nova Scotia for five of its 18 counties, so they had regionalization as well. Present-day New Brunswick was created a colonial province separate from Nova Scotia in 1784. The first enactment of its new legislature was to define the boundaries of the counties into which the province would be divided. Prince Edward Island was divided into three counties at a similarly early period. Ontario and Quebec also had county structures from an early time. The western provinces had divisions that were set up as numbered divisions, and some of those remain to this day. The majority of those divisions in Alberta are now referred to as counties with specific names. British Columbia, too, established its regions. All of the other provinces of what is today Canada, from an early time, had regionalization. So did all of the states in the United States. While this information about Newfoundland and Labrador may come as a surprise to many outside of this province, it is reasonably well known to most within the province. But I'm not sure its impact on regionalization is known. That early history of Newfoundland and Labrador reflects a set of circumstances that clearly made development and implementation of a system of regionalization virtually impossible, at least prior to the middle of the 19th century. It does not, however, fully account for the failure to establish regionalization from the, in the ensuing 165 years. The second period I mentioned is from responsible government in 1855 to confederation in 1949. During this period, apart from those living in St. John's and a half a dozen small towns not far from St. John's, the entire population of the province was scattered among small fishing set settlements distributed along thousands of miles of the island's extensive coastline and a smaller number of settlements distributed along the coast of the southern portion of Labrador. With ocean fishery as its primary economic focus during most of the time, and having all its communities on tidewater, virtually all intercommunity transportation was by water, with precious few roads. While deliberate prevention of colonization was no longer a factor, Geography and historical practice were important factors. And in the context of economic and administrative matters, they were big factors. While there was some mining and pulp and paper production in the first half of the 20th century, ocean fishery was still the major economic driver during this period. The overwhelming majority of the people lived in small communities and fishing settlements, virtually all of which were on tidewater and many of those were on islands. The settlements were also usually separated by long distances, and virtually all community transportation was by water. There were precious few roads. To the extent that we identified any areas in terms of regions, it was as bays. And even this was only 
to identify the location of, of the community we were referring to. It had nothing to do with the processes for local involvement in management of matters of local interest or advocacy for local needs or even regional governmental administration. After 1832, there were a few road boards based on the political districts, but the, their efforts were confined to roads and bridges. These boards fell into disuse at the beginning of the 20th century. This peculiar history also resulted in what would become government's major challenge in this province, the provision of normal public services to its citizens in the geographic, demographic, and economic circumstances peculiar to this province. By 1911, this province had a population of less than a quarter of a million people. But that population was divided amongst 1,447 separate settlements, all but a small portion of which had no road or rail interconnection and were widely distributed along the many thousands of miles of coastline, many of which were on islands. Discharging in those circumstances the public service obligations of government to deliver justice and security services, health, education, welfare services, and meet the transportation needs of its citizens, quite apart from providing any regional economic development assistance, was virtually impossible. There's no way of knowing whether a structure of regionalization could have made the difference in those circumstances. These basic characteristics of Newfoundland and Labrador life continued well into the 20th century. The building of the railroad at the end of the 19th and early part of the 20th century changed this in only a slow and limited manner. The substantial change did not come until after Confederation in 1949, when a system of highways was built. Even though identification of regions as bays had substantially lost its purpose and significance, we have not successfully replaced it with a land-based alternative. Despite these high numbers of individual settlements, not only was there no regionalization structure in place, there was no municipal structure outside of St. John's until the middle part of the 20th century. The consequences of this was noted by the Amory Royal Commission that in 1933 was investigating the country's inability to service its public debt. In its report, it wrote, quote, the absence of any form of municipal government and the conduct of the entire administration of the country from St. John's, which is itself to a large extent out of touch with the outports, have had an unfortunate effect upon the people in retarding the development of a public spirit and a sense of public responsibility, unquote. It was not until 1942 that the town of Windsor became the first municipality to be incorporated, and later that year the town of Cornerbrook West became the second. From then on, municipal incorporation steadily increased. One aspect of the problem that has changed considerably over the last 70 years, driven in part at least by transportation changes, is reduction in the number of settlements in the province. Through a combination of voluntary abandonment and government incentivized resettlement, over that time, residents of smaller remote, remote and island communities moved to larger interconnected settlements. By the early 1990s, when I was in office as Premier, the number of settlements had been reduced to about 800, and the population had increased to close to 580,000 at one stage. Obviously, this did not eliminate or even diminish the need for regionalization. There are many other drawbacks and limiting consequences of not having a land-focused system of regionalization. Think about these. Of necessity, the provincial government focuses its attention on the province as a whole, as a unit, and there's no agency to focus on a specific region. The interests and concerns of each region are usually peculiar to that specific region and the residents of that region have a greater understanding of those interests and concerns. As well, detached governmental action from afar, like in St. John's, with little or no local input, seldom produces the most effective and efficient responses to promote local interest 
and address local concerns. Absent a regional agency, there is no convenient means by which the residents of an area with common interests and concerns can draw attention to and promote those interests and promote solutions for those concerns. In the absence of processes that enable and facilitate it, there is little, or at least greatly diminished, opportunity or incentive for the region's residents to take any direct responsibility to address concerns. I remember speaking about the situation and its consequences on a couple of occasions when I was a member of the legislature during the late 1960s, but nothing came of it. There seemed to be an aversion to regionalization based, I believe, on apprehension that it would simply result in creating another level of government with taxing authority. I believe this kind of apprehension is alive and well today. It is, in my view, the most significant challenge to implementing an effective and efficient system of regionalization in this province in the future. The case for regionalization is most likely to be successful if it is demonstrably shown to be focused on providing residents of the region with the opportunity and means to be involved in determining what is in the best interest of the region, the means of advocating for it, as well as making the effort necessary to achieve it. One of the objectives I had when I became Premier in 1989 was to address some of the consequences of the absence of regionalization in the province. There was no convenient structure to facilitate coordination of efforts by residents of the different regions to promote economic development or improvement or other services for the region. As a result, economic activity in the province was developing a seriously increasing imbalance, resulting in a major shift to population from all other areas to the Northeast Avalon, particularly to the St. John's and Conception Bay South areas. While that was temporarily great for St. John's as the capital city, left unchecked, it could be disastrous for the remainder of the province and ultimately for St. John's as well. There's not much pleasure in being the capital of nothing else, only the area where you're located. The then new government, early, it's the earliest actions taken by the then new government included first putting in place the Economic Recovery Commission to address the province's many economic activity concerns, and second, the development of a strategic economic plan. A key feature of that plan was the division of the province into 17, and this was later revised to be 20, economic zones. The stated objective of the regional economic zones were these. First, the development of economic plans by the people in each zone. Second, communities in each economic zone to undertake joint initiatives which will benefit the whole zone. Third, government to strengthen the major centers in each zone to ensure that they have the necessary infrastructure and services to attract new investment and build a strong economic base. The economic zones to work more efficiently and effectively with the five regional offices of Enterprise Newfoundland and Labrador, which was the operating agency for the Economic Recovery Commission, toward ensuring that each economic zone's a plan is considered in the policy and program directions being pursued by the uh, Economic Recovery Commission and other government agencies. The, the fifth one was the province was to promote more effectively the economic opportunities and strengths of each zone and region. And sixth, it was to provide for more regionalization of governmental administration. It was government's thinking at the time that such major centers as existed in each zone would be strengthened to make them as attractive as possible for new investment. Eventually, they would become the expected growth centers for that zone. People who wished to could continue to live in the smaller settlements, but would be expected to commute to the larger centers for work and access to government services. Undoubtedly, over time, this would result in many smaller communities ceasing to exist but many would remain and expand as purely residential communities. It took a few years, and there was some resistance, 
but progress was slowly achieved. People in the regions were pleased to have such an opportunity, to have a say in what would be done in their region, instead of being told what others had decided was going to be done or not be done. And residents of the zones were taking advantage of the opportunities to be so involved. By the time I left office, there were active functioning local boards in most of the economic zones, supported by provincial agencies with good signs of the region's continuing interest in regionalization. However, provincial government and government agency support for the approach and for the regional economic boards seem to have slowly diminished after I left office. A later government abandoned this support altogether. Ultimately, this killed that effort to achieve regionalization. In my view, the need for a structure of regionalization in this province is as great now as it ever was. It will, I believe, be difficult, if not impossible, to put one in place with a top-down approach. The chances of it again being accepted by the people of the province will be much greater if it is presented on the basis of a bottom-up approach. In other words, a structure whereby the residents of a region will be assisted to involve themselves in identifying the needs of their region, promoting the means of addressing those needs, and ultimately implementing the solutions, rather than simply being told what will or will not be done. Achieve that kind of regionalization, and I believe acceptance by citizens of a greater level of responsibility for their regions will follow. Thank you very much for listening to me.